Welcome to this episode of Bounded in a Nutshell. Remember to take a moment to click on the link below to donate to a very special organization. Figure Skating in Harlem is the first organization in the world to combine the power of education with the grace and discipline of figure skating. It is dedicated to developing confidence, leadership, and academic achievement in young girls from low-income backgrounds. The numerous stories of success from its alumni owe a great deal to the unique blend of mentoring and self-expression that is championed by FSH. Remember, no donation is too small or too large to keep the dream alive for these exceptional young girls. Thank you very much. Enjoy the show. Welcome to uh, Bounded in a Nutshell on this Tuesday afternoon. Oh, morning, actually. It's quite early. So my next guest was born in Leatherhead, Surrey in England. Deborah studied at Leeds University. She has appeared in numerous productions at the Royal Shakespeare Company, including the much lauded production of Twelfth Night opposite Tony Sher and The Merchants of Venice. She won an Obie for her performance in the original production of Carol Churchill's Top Girls after it transferred from the Royal Court to the public. In 1997, she won an Olivier and Critic Award for Outstanding Featured Actress for a performance as Hilda in Pam James Stanley. Other notable theatre roles include Volumnia and Coriolanus at the Dunmar, Sally in Carol Churchill's Escaped Alone, and Hazel in Lucy Kirkwood's The Children, at the, the Children, which was played at the Royal Court and later transferred to Broadway. Deborah would receive a Tony nomination for a reprisal of the role. Of the role. Her film credits include Truly Madly Deeply, one of my favorites all time, Jack and Sarah, The, the End of the Affair, Vanity Fair, Summer, The Lady in the Van, Jackie, and Hampstead. Deborah, it's a real pleasure to, um... oh wait, I haven't mentioned your television credits, which is important for me. Her TV credits include <laughs> Megray, The Last Train, Coils War, Messiah, Cranford, Return to Cranford, Children of the Earth, Silent Witness, and of course, playing the indomitable the Ruth Defoe in The Split. Um, <laughs> Ruth, uh, that would, I can't believe I almost forgot that. Deborah will be seen in the upcoming miniseries, The Drowning. Deborah, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us today. So, How are you? I'm very well. I mean, surprisingly well. Uh, it's, it's sort of such a weird, strange time, isn't it? But I mean, I'm very, very fortunate because I live in a beautiful part of London um and i've got so I, i've got access to lots of greenery uh, i've got the heath hampstead heath and uh, alexandra palace park wow. and i've got a great big garden that i'm <laughs> growing lots of vegetables in and you know so i'm, I'm getting back to nature so you're doing <laughs> a bit of farm to table yeah <laughs> and it, it's so strange because um it's very easy to live in your own little bubble and think, well, this is all right, you know, and then, and then you hear about all the, the deaths and the awful things that are happening. And it's, it's, it's hard to get your mind around sometimes. Absolutely. I mean, I think sometimes it's, I don't know, you start thinking about it and it's somewhat overwhelming and mm. weirdly ridiculous at the same time that it's, you just shut it down in a weird way, mm. you know? And I think, I, d I mean, I don't, I don't know what the situation is in America, but here, uh, right at the beginning, like in, in Mar March, April, it was complete lockdown. So in a way that was sort of simpler to get your head around because everybody was self-isolating and the, the message was stay at home. Now <laughs> they're easing it up and I think everybody's not quite sure what to do. Where, what to do you know but i mean one of the other things that has been absolutely amazing around here is the bird song <laughs> it it is it's incredible because there have no there's been no uh there's been no traffic traffic so and and everybody's been at home and so it's but quite and the bird song is has been spectacular <laughs> because it's one, I mean, ironically and sort of, it's wonderful and awful at the same time, but it's been one of the most beautiful springs. Cloudless blue skies, of course, because mm -hmm. there's no pollution. Pollution. Um, and, and no aeroplanes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just been so beautiful. I, I love the fact that I, you're clearly a silver, uh, the 
glass is half full kind of person <laughs> in an outlook, which is one of the things I love about you. <laughs> yeah. Tell me a little, let's go back to Leatherhead, sorry. I, I well, went to school, sorry. I right. went to school, sorry, in Catrum. So I, I, I love that part of England a great deal. Tell us how, what was the journey um, from Deborah, young Deborah in Leatherhead to Well, I don't Deborah. quite know where you've got Leatherhead. It wasn't Leatherhead. No, <laughs> I also, I, that's my, my research said Leatherhead. Where was it in Surrey? You well, better go change Wikipedia. <laughs> Where was it then? I never, I never look at any of that stuff. So oh, I, okay. Um, no, it was, I was born in a, in a village called Cheam, which was okay. in Surrey. But it's the yes. same, it's the same area, yeah. Right. Um, and, Is it close uh, to Leatherhead? Wish. <laughs> <laughs> All right, tell us about that. Where that could come from. It doesn't really matter, does it? It, 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 it was, a, it was a, a suburban upbringing, south, south, south of London, you know. Mm -hmm. It wasn't London, it was a village near London. And um, yeah, it was a small, small little village. Uh, and I mean, I suppose one of the things that we did, my whole family was involved in at the Amateur Dramatic Society of Team, which is my little village. Yeah. And we were all involved in St Dunstan's Young Players. Oh my God, I know St Dunstan's. We used to play them at rugby. One of the few did games you? we would win. Yeah, Catron used to play St Dunstan's at rugby. Yeah. Oh, it was fun. <laughs> that's why we get along so well. So well. <laughs> Yeah, go on. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, my my mother used to make all the costumes, and um, my father used to do all the tickets. And my sister, she she uh, she was in the she was in the plays. She didn't much like it, but I loved it. I joined when I was seven, and I I played the, my first role on stage was. Uh, in Alice in Wonderland, and I played Alice when she shrank. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to shrink, pretend you well, shrank. Well, I was the, the, the shrunken. The, the, yes, the actor playing Alice for the rest of the play, and then yeah, I yeah. came, sort of just for a brief moment. I was her when she shrank. But, yeah. <laughs> so that was my that was my first role, and um, I loved it. But I think the other thing that I, uh, that started me, I don't know, where, where, do, where do we all start? I think I've always been, I've always made believe. I, I've always lived in the sort of make believe world. When I was little, it was, uh, I would just, I loved dressing up. I loved, um, you know, whenever I was doing something, I was, I was pretending it was something else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just lived in a make-believe world. And I think that's where my acting came from. I mean, I, we, didn't, we didn't go to the theatre um, as such much to see anything. So it wasn't, it wasn't some, you know, it wasn't a question of seeing something on stage and wanting to be on it. You know? yeah. It was yeah. much more this whole thing of pretending and make believe that's where that's where I came from and uh, uh, yeah so I, I um, but it so I was in St Dunstan's Young Players but when we when when I you know when I got to about 13 or something I you there was there was St Dunstan's Players and you, you sort of you <laughs> went on that and I didn't like them because I found them very, you know, they were all, all the elements I felt of the worst sort of actor. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I absolutely know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't like that. So I didn't do that. And, and, I, um, uh, and I didn't really start acting again. And I, I went to university in Leeds and... Um, that was extraordinary. That was sort of a whole other world because it was a very, very far cry from the little village in... Village. Leeds is, village is just life. one of the most exciting universities in England still. I remember Leeds it was... Is. 
it was high on everyone's list if you wanted to have a great education and have a great time. You know, Leeds, yeah. Newcastle, Leeds, Newcastle, Nottingham, sort of had, Manchester had that reputation, didn't yeah. they? Yeah, the red yeah. brick, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. It was fantastic. And um, I, I, I got to know a whole group of people and we actually, we actually stayed on in Leeds afterwards and we formed our own theatre group. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we, yeah, we put on plays and we sort of, it seemed to attract people from, from other, other towns, other, other places and they came and they had their own experiences and, and um, knowledge of theatre. So it, it was a sort of a workshop that we, we created ourselves. Um, and we, yeah, we, so we, people wrote the plays and we put them on. And I mean, it was a time when it was sort of possible to do that. There was a lot, <laughs> there, there seemed to be a lot of grants. And also there were, in, in, in England, there were, um, there were a lot more regional theatres, so there, there was the, there was the possibility of touring and and having these uh, yeah creating our tours. And we did a rock we did a couple of rock operas. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, yeah, so it was it was just great. Uh, so and it was, but it was it wasn't it was it was all sort of based on street theatre. Mm. Street theatre and um, drama scapes, and you know, it was. And I think we, the, the, this group, sort of felt that um, sort of traditional, conventional theatre in a building was. That's not what we wanted to do. We were sort of more oh. cutting edge, or sometimes just stupid. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. But but finally, uh, that all for for various reasons. That 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 group came to an end and I but, but from all the experience that I I had had uh, over in Leeds I got a job down in um, in London in Strat at Stratford East mm -hmm. and which is another fantastic theatre yeah uh, and that was a community it was it was to, to be in a community show there but then they asked me to, to join the company proper and uh, so I did and I spent two years there and that was fantastic because that was um, that was uh, all the plays were new new writing so we would we would be playing one one play in the evening and one and, and rehearsing one play in the in the day mm -hmm. it, was, it was just and that was all yes it was all different sorts of plays about everything. So what I've done, is you can sort of see what I've done, I, and I didn't go to drama school, because mm -hmm. I didn't really know. That's interesting. Was that, was yeah. that, a, was that a, a, back then, was that a problem, not going to drama school? Or what was it, did most people, was it, uh, it's such, I mean, what was the conversation around drama school versus non-drama school in your, in your well, process? Well, um, you see that, that, I think, I, I was, as I remember, I think for a start, I never thought, you know, my family, I didn't know anybody in my family who had, who had been an actor or had had anything to do with the theatre, apart mm -hmm. from the amateur dramatic sort of stuff. Um, and so, so to go to drama school seemed a bit, <laughs> not, not Wait. Start, you know what I yeah. didn't think it was sort of feasible really yeah um and but also I'd heard and this I don't know what because you, you can tell me but I'd heard that uh you know if you go to if you went to drama school they they break you down and then they build you back up yeah that's that's the, and that's I didn't the... want to <laughs> I didn't want to be broken down. <laughs> well, partly I, th I, I think I thought if I was broken down, I wouldn't get back together again. Back, back to put, so, put yourself back but, together again. Yeah, so what I mean is that by, um, by, by having this group from Leeds and, from, and it was people who came, came to this group 
who had been to drama school and had that experience and they and and they run classes so we were doing it off our own bat but in a very in a way a very safe environment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean it's it's sort of i think looking back it's taken it's obviously taken me a lot longer because i've had to I've had to learn on my feet. I've had to learn in front of an audience rather than make my mistakes at drama school. Cool. You know so I mean? tell us a bit of, about talking about learning in front of the audience. Um, one of uh, the, uh, the listeners in today, um, observers today, you know, got in touch with us and was waxing lyrical about the 12th night. Uh, she saw you in with Tony oh. Shea. I mean, literally saying, can you get me in because of that 12th, I mean, I saw her in that 12th <laughs> night and stuff. Tell us a little bit, I mean, was that your first time at the RSC when you did that or did you work your way up? I mean, what, who were you in that production? Olivia. You were Olivia. So to, can you tell us a little bit yeah. about what it was like for you? Well, in, that was... Tony Sher at the time was Tony Sher at his peak, you know, around the, that, the Richard III and all those titles, the, the, yeah. all those incredible performances that you know what was that experience like for you well that was my first that that was my first season at the rsc and i played right. portia Good, in, great way to start <laughs> well yes portia in the merchant of venice wow that was my first with tony yeah and uh and then olivia and in 12th night and it was again it was a big big shock um, because I'd been, uh, if up to then I'd been, you know, I'd been, as I say, I'd been doing all of the stuff with my group, then, then the Stratford East, and then I'd played, uh, at the Royal Court and, but, but sort of quite fringy type. Yes. Uh, and, and not that much money. Yes. And then you go to... You go to Stratford, you go to the RSC, and it's suddenly, you know, I mean, it's big, and it's, uh, you know, you've, you've got all the, you've got all the back backing with the the costumes and the everything, and yeah. it it took me, it took me a time to um, to come to terms with that, mm -hmm. and. I think I, I had been certainly with with the Merchant of Venice. I'd and that because that happened first. I uh, I had as I say I'd been used to quite a sort of a small company where you you sort of work things out. It was a very communal experience, and everybody sort of worked the thing out together. Yeah. Um, and coming to to the RSC at that time, uh, it was very different because people had their their take on it. Mm -hmm. um, well, certainly so, Tony would have, you know. Yes, <laughs> <she did>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I learned, but I learned a huge amount doing doing um, uh, the Merchant of Venice, and I just loved doing the tw doing Twelfth Night because I just thought I understand that woman and um, and it was a great cast it was just just lovely uh, and I'd, I'd sort of by then I'd got the measure of 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 this company and how to approach it and I I'd sort of I came I came to the I think I came to the production with a very clear idea of what I wanted to do with Olivia. Yeah. Tell me a little bit because yeah. there's going to be some people watching and stuff like that because I mean certainly at the RSC I remember going there my first you know I mean it was incredible life but my first few weeks was a uh, speech uh, and verse with John Barton and with Cicely Berry. I mean that technical side and from what you said you didn't come from a very technical side you came from a very of the royal court kitchen sink, you know, whatever. Yeah. Was that, I mean, what was, the, I mean, how was that like? I'm just thinking of the actors out there that have this, 
divide between Shakespeare and then everything else. <laughs> you know, yeah. what was that like for you coming to the RSC with that? And how well, did you adapt I... that into your acting? What did you bring to it, you know? Well, I had, um, it wasn't my first uh, experience of Shakespeare. Uh, my, my f the first uh, play I did was, uh, Isab uh, no, not Isabella, uh, Mariana in Measure for Measure. Right. And I really didn't, I didn't understand, I didn't, I didn't get Shakespeare. I didn't get the verse. I didn't mm -hmm. sort of, didn't. And then um, I was asked to play uh, Lady Macbeth in Macbeth. <laughs> and wow. um, uh, at Southampton uh, Theatre. And I, it just clicked. And I just completely fell in love with the, the verse, the structure, the words, I just, it just, it just all fell into place. So I, I was, I, I didn't find the, the, the playing, actually, I didn't find playing the play or the characters difficult. It was, uh, it was more to do with the, almost like the politics of the, or the, the, the mechanics of putting it all on and mm -hmm. um, where when you, you are in the clicked. company. When you say clicked, because wow, what it clicked but, working with someone or what, what, what clicked? How do you mean it clicked? Were you? That it clicked, what the, I suddenly understood, I just suddenly fell in love with Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. It clicked. I, my my understanding of of the the verse and the text and the words and how he uses the words and the phrasing and all of that. Mm -hmm. I it it I could just feel it, and I don't think that's ever left me really. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's it's sort of not not got anything to do with um, rigid meter or anything like that but it, yeah. it, i just i just loved it right actually enjoying saying the words as it were looking yes, forward to definitely. saying the words yes like, yeah and Embrace also it. i i think that um and i i think one thing i wanted to say to people here was that if you're looking at shakespeare or, or any any play really the text is your friend <laughs> that <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not something that you want to change or, or it, it, and particularly with Shakespeare, it, it gives you so many um, pointers and, and clues to the character or to, to the scene or to what they're feeling. Um, and and it's, it's almost like a, a detective. You, you, just, you just mine it, don't you? Yeah. And that when I sort of understood that, I just fell in love with it. Um, but I did, it, was, it was a very steep learning curve being at the RSC that first time, because I wasn't, I wasn't uh, as you say, Chuck, I, I, my experience at the Royal Court and, and much more, what were you saying? The sort of, Kitchen sink, street, yes. edgy, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, that hadn't quite prepared me for the size of, mm. of, of the RSC. And I didn't really, apart, apart from Twelfth Night, I loved Twelfth Night, but I, I didn't feel, I didn't feel my, that Porsche that I gave for The Merchant of Venice, that wasn't, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Really. Right. I, I was sort of railroaded into it a bit, but um, but subsequently, but you know, I I learned an immense amount mm -hmm. um, from that from the time of, of being there. And also we kind of all we kind of all have performances, don't we? If we're gonna be honest, that you just go. It's not so much that you necessarily want another crack at them, although that is often the case. Where you just think, I didn't, I didn't own that I, I sort of did it mm. and it was fine but I never thought what do I want to what do I want to mm. bring to it you know I, I fit into the cog and you, it's always with a bit of regret you sit back and go there wasn't a moment where you just stopped 
Mm. And, and had a conversation with yourself as to what you wanted to do. It wasn't that it was bad or anything like that. You just knew there was, I, I, I always come back to my first uh, big role at the RSC, which was um, Ophidius in Coriolanus. And oh. it, was, it was good. It was, it was great. And it was opposite the wonderful Greg Hicks, who's a dear friend. And I, I, it was fine. I enjoyed it. It, it, it. People enjoyed it. But I remember afterwards, years later, as I started doing more stuff and just going, I never once stopped. I was so locked into the language and clarity and doing this scene, the way it's been directed, that it, I never remember taking the breath for myself. I don't know if that's similar to what you're thinking, you know? Um, well, I think, um, oh, I, I'm not sure. I, well, yeah, with, with, the, um, <laughs> with The Merchant of Venice, it's a, very, it's a problematic play. It's right, a problematic yeah. play. And, um, and the, both Tony and the director, Bill Alexander, had mm. a very particular take on take. it, which was very to do, concerned with Shylock. Mm -hmm. uh, and <laughs> it, was, it, it was Tony playing Shylock. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was my, <laughs> and it was my first, first go in a big company, you know. Yeah. And, if I had gone back several years later, I would have fought a lot harder for Portia's take on, on that play. Um, and probably it would have been a better production mm. because there, this, would have that, there would have been that, um, you know, conflict. coming together and conflict. Yeah. But, and that, that's what I regret. Uh, Is that and that, but that's what? what I learned, and that's and you know I mean there's always a balance, isn't there? Um, I think there's a balance between coming to a coming to a production with a very very clear idea of what you want, what you want, and you will brook nothing, and you know, and and that's that's not very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, it's not very helpful either to say, oh, well, I'll just do whatever you like, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah. You've, it, it, it's, it's the best thing, I think, is to come, come to a, a production, film or television or theater or whatever, with a very strong feeling, but, you're, but, but prepared to change or work yeah. with other people. Right. So was that part of that experience? Did that inform some of your uh, ideas and, 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 and um, views when you came to lending your voice to Clamorous Voices, the book? Clamorous Voices? The, there was a collection of women speaking about Shakespearean roles and stuff and you, you know, you, I, I have here that you were one of the people included in the book. I was going to ask you about that book because a lot of people read it. You didn't lend your voice to any of the... I, I did which... um, Players of Shakespeare. Right. I wrote... I wrote tell us about I that. Wrote, you wrote that. Okay, tell us about I that. I wrote a, lot, what... a, a, big, a big piece about, about, about um, The Women. Merchant of Venice. Yes. No, it wasn't for women. It was well. It was about the Merchant of Venice, and basically, I that's I I was saying in that in that essay what I've just said that I felt mm -hmm. I felt that um, I didn't uh, that Portia is a wonderful, wonderful role, a wonderful character, and quite often um, she's sort of sidelined by uh, by Shylock and mm -hmm. actually it, it's it's a really really wonderful important role and I think she's a fabulous she's a fabulous heroine and I would okay, like well, to have it again. Is that, that, that view and stuff I mean let's go back to Top Girls you know mm. and you know recently listed as one of the 15 greatest plays ever written you know Carol yeah. Churchill's Top Girls and you were in that cast which is about empowering women and women in, a, in the new world, how we see them and stuff. How, how, I mean, that, of course, that brought you a lot of success with that role, but I'm guessing 
that role really spoke to you playing doing a project like that Joyce yes playing Joyce yes, yes. I mean it was wonderful uh, I, I, I wasn't I wasn't quite sure it's funny, isn't it? When, when, you, when, when you're in something, a, a new play, you don't, you don't know if it's going to work or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think any of us really were sure, sure quite how powerful and wonderful it, it was going to be. Um, and I, I mean, I, want, I wanted to play Joyce. <coughs> she was a lot, she was, quite far away from me mm -hmm. um, but I thought she was fantastic a fantastic character but all of them were and mm -hmm. I, I mean I, I loved I loved playing because when I did it uh, it was it was with a smaller group recently it's been done again yes at, at the national with I think about 14 or so people women in it and each mm -hmm. playing individual parts but I played three parts mm -hmm. we were all doubling up apart yeah. from um, the woman who played Marlene who, kept, who went all the way through you right know. through yeah um, but I just I felt I felt that there was that made it a quite a, a, a well it just it was a co very cohesive group of people to work with you know, because there was just seven of us, seven or eight yeah. of us. And that. Yeah. Um, and, oh, it was wonderful. And I mean, the, uh, the scene at the end between the two, two sisters, mm -hmm. it's just one of the best, best written scenes. Is that think. something you sort of look, I mean, let's, I mean, I saw you in um, The Chill, apart from working with you, obviously, you know, uh, saw you in The Children, which had its own, um, take on on environmental issues and and family mm. also and and mm. all that are you, are, when you pick your roles in theater i mean are, are those sort of bigger issues i mean like we said you know are they are they a big part of your decision are you do you go after plays that have as it were that sort of universal or political takes on life and stuff i mean what do you or do you just go with what you think oh that would be a juicy role you know well, i think it's a bit of both i think yeah. um <clears throat> i i i read when i when i'm given a script i read it first and if it's if it grabs me i mean all of those all of those plays that we've been talking about they they were just such fantastic plays um, and issues and things and also the roles were wonderful mm -hmm. so that that but I think I think I look for something that I would be interested in seeing mm -hmm. and I would be interested in working on yeah I mean I think I think one of the things um, with with theater is that you you're going to st you've got to realize that you're going to live with it for quite a few weeks or months <laughs> so it's best to be to be stimulated and interested by it yeah um, and and also i think i look for a character that that has got a storyline that has that that is and is that is germane to to the the whole story but it's also right. got their particular story, I think. Mm. It's, just, it's just to keep yourself interested, isn't it? Absolutely. I have a very short shelf life of interest. So it's really important. <laughs> it's really important to have that. So let's move specifically to, okay, the first time I met you was on the set of The Split. And I just love the dynamic we have our mm. characters together. But one thing I really loved about your acting was, was it, it's it's um quite i can't predict how you're going to digest stuff and it come i like being surprised on the toes and i just found i stopped acting when i worked opposite you i just was like watching ruth do you know what i mean yes the yeah, well, that's because wonderful. they would be i was like they, tell us a little bit about because if you go into a role 
thinking, oh, I'm going to be unpredictable and quirky. Once you tell yourself that, you're the opposite. It's, it's awful. Mm -hmm. you, but there must be something about the way you, I mean, my producer, Michelle, will tell you, you're like a favorite, you know, she saw the split and was like, fell in love because of that unpredictability and stuff. I guess my question, what's my question is, certainly with, let's talk about film and TV where you don't have the words of a Porsche or the words of an Olivia, say. Yeah. How do, how, do you, how do you break down a script? How, how, let's talk about Ruth specifically, Ruth Defoe. What did you see when you saw that script? What gave you the ideas for Ruth's um, quirkiness, as I see it, you know? <laughs> That's just me, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, really, talk about that because a lot of the previous guests have talked about, talked about bringing yourself to the role, blending that role into yourself instead of thinking of putting a character on top of it. So yeah. expand on that a bit, you know? Well, I've, I, and I felt that more and more, because we've done two series now. Season, yes, yes, yes. And, yes. Um, uh, and I felt that more and more in the second series, that particularly with television, and um, in a way, you're, it, it does come down to just be, uh, playing, just, just playing it simply, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think. I mean, well, I, when I, I love. I, I mean, I was so excited about reading the script for for the split. I thought it was just fantastic on all fronts. I mean, it was brilliant writing by Abby uh, Morgan, and the fact that it was very. It, there were these dynamic women. Um, sort of center stage, which isn't mm -hmm. useful, is it? Um, no. And that's that was very very exciting. Um, but it was a big challenge for me to be um, the mother and the sort of dominant figure of these three extremely powerful, intelligent women who were playing my daughters. You know, mm -hmm. so it was it it was a big it was a big challenge for me. Um, and, and in the end, I suppose what you have to do is to, as I said before, you have to trust the writing mm -hmm. um, and think, well, yes, I, I, am, I am a powerful woman. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, that is given, isn't it? I mean, that's... Um, uh, the way people treat you it's that that helps for you for your status doesn't it? yeah um and uh so uh, but i think i think i don't know what if you felt that um in a way in the second series abby's sort of started writing that again there's a mixture of of us and the character <laughs> Yes. And I yeah, know yeah. that, that um, <clears throat> Ruth has changed quite a lot. Yeah. And in a way, I think, I think Xander has. Xander has changed a lot, yes. Yeah. It helps when you have a writer that sits back and doesn't give the full story and watches what you bring to it. Yeah. And then starts adapting the character to yeah. who you are in many ways, even though there is a storyline you're following. So, but I think, I think it goes back to what I was saying right at the beginning about where I come from as an actor, because I've been thinking about this prior to this thing. Great. But, um, the, it's it's make-believe. It's playing. It's playing. So that's what I love. Um, and I love the... I, I think the, the energy and the life happens between... It's somewhere in, in, in the, the connection between the two actors. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm as, I'm, I'm as bound up with you playing, you know, in our scene, as you are with me. I, mm -hmm. I don't. So I'm responding to you and you're responding to me. And that's, that's the best. Yes. I think, I think when you get two, two people who, who like to play with each other, Absolutely. That's, that's the best. It's funny how that is weird. It almost seems obvious or whatever, but 
it, it I know in my experience it's really helped when when you like you put it you like to play with this person you're looking forward to the scenes with this person and somehow all the technical things go out the window and I, I guess it's sort of like a looking for the trust with each other do you know what I mean and once you've found it you know it's there and all those lessons you sort of learn about acting, about letting go and breathing and being in, they sort of take care of themselves because you, you kind of trust the person. So I just wonder whether that's, yes. is, and it, I mean, is that I, part of, yeah, go on. Go I on. think when I, again, cause I, I was learning, but I, I was going to say I was learning on my feet, but then I don't think when I would have gone to drama school that there was that much um, teaching about film technique. I don't know if there is now, but. Um, but you know you, the, the old thing of uh, if you're if you're on camera you don't you don't move your mouth and you're sort of like that and, you know, and that's that's such a rubbish because where's the energy there's no, there's nothing so yeah. I've sort of I've got I've got more confident in um, in acting in front of a camera just to be and not not mind what my face does yeah yeah well there was a really interesting quote i saw i think it was it might have been meryl streep or something saying that um you, you you should never worry about the last thing you should worry about is what your face is doing mm. is you should just be worried about what's going on inside what you're thinking or yeah. whatever leave your face alone and i think that's one of the dangers I had with the camera is like, oh, there's a camera. I have to now be very aware of when my eye goes there, or how wide yeah. my eyes are, or when I switch, you know, those things. And so it's, 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 but, and then you don't leave space for the stuff on the inside, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so, so, um, do you have a preference? I mean, right now, because what I thought was fascinating was meeting you, this humility you brought to the whole process of, there's this incredible resume of work you've done over the years and stuff. And yet on set for this, it was still all rather exciting. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and new, but. Well, yes, I, I, I do. And I think, again, that goes back to <clears throat> how I started out because, yeah. um, you know, every job was a learning. There's something to learn. There was something to learn and there still is. And I will never, yeah. I'll never stop doing that. So every yes. job is you learn something new. I mean, you 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 bring something. Yeah. Um, but uh, and and other people have had experiences that you can learn from. And you would be, yeah. I think, you would be foolish not to listen and to be open to that sort of um, yeah. Yeah. Knowledge yeah. and um, you know and. You know, I mean, I've uh, as well. Like I've been, uh, I've, I've done a. Uh, you must have done as well. I've done quite a few workshops, mm -hmm. and I like doing those as well because yes. it just, they're just interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it, my my father, he was a reporter on a local paper, the Surrey Comet, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, and he was a great great role model for me because he said. Uh, do something that makes you happy because don't do something for money do something that makes you happy and that's what I've done and I think if you can I mean we are hugely privileged aren't we yes yes, yes. or yes. we have been I don't know quite what's gonna what's happen gonna happen after that. We'll, do, but we'll be doing a lot more workshops on zoom <laughs> Um, can, can I ask this question? Because I have asked it for every guest. It's probably my only uh, question I ask everyone. I uh, um, and my guests are getting sick of it. But it's the albums in a picture question. You know, is in an album everyone you only post up the happy pictures. This is when we were here, and this is what. But there's all those gaps in the middle that lead to that happiness. The work that has to be done, and the disappointment, and the the bad times. We don't put the pictures of the bad times in the album. You know. Have there been moments like that in your life, like long stretches of not knowing what was coming next? How did you get through them? How do, how do you look in the mirror in the morning and keep saying, I still want to do this till the next bulb goes off? Do you know what I mean? I do. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, a friend of mine 
said, uh, when you're out of work, look on it as the time you have to do all the things you can't do when you're working. So that's, that's sort of quite a good mantra. Yeah. So, uh, um, but I ha yeah, I have had, I have had times, quite long times out of work because I've, I've, ch I, I've turned quite a lot of stuff down in my day. Um, mm -hmm. but, and some things I regret having turned down, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but um, yes, but you just, I, it's never got to a point, it's never got to a point where I thought I'm going to do something else. Um, I've, it's, I've always had another job. Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, I don't. What, what are you What are you saying? So you're asking. You're asking how I cope with being out of work. Oh, not just out of work, but just the About work is intertwined in our lives. Also, in the moments where it's been hard to uh, be happy or stay positive, and and when you know. A lot of that, sadly, when you're an artist, has to do with your work, with your, you know, with the the work you're doing. And I just wondered how you get yourself through those moments of incredible doubt, incredible fear, incredible second guessing, um, and how you've you've managed to stay on track. You know. Um. Oh, Chuck, I don't. Um... <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a big question. Like, I, I know a lot of the time I lean on remembering what you've done, remember who you are. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Those are sort of mantras that, that help me through them. And I just wondered whether there's been a time when you've had to really fall back on, on either that ch remembering why you're doing this or, like you said, the advice your father gave you. It's what makes you happy. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think. I think possibly at the back of my mind, not now, but at mm -hmm. the back of my mind, there was a time where I thought, well, if this doesn't work, I'm going to, I'll do something else. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and I did, I did have, a, I, I, I did have a, a, an, an envelope a, a sort of a thing, a folder or something um, of, nice letters that people had written me <laughs> <laughs> letters that give confidence yes um because because particularly doing and particularly doing theater which is such a transitory thing uh it's it's hard sometimes to uh, mm -hmm. to keep hold of that isn't it yes it's only we, we only do it and then we live in people's memories yeah, that's that's part of it. I mean, I never that the other thing that I thought when I was sort of coming to the end of university and thinking what I wanted to do, I thought I don't I don't want to I don't want to do something that I know that what I'm going to be doing in five years time. Wow. <laughs> so you wanted so, that uncertainty. Yeah, you wanted that uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, and I did, and I chose, I chose that path. And it's been an incredibly varied career. Uh, and I, I relish that. Um, doing all sorts of different, different mediums and singing and any, anything and radio and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but but I had to say, I had to say to myself, well, you chose, you chose that life. You chose to be with, with, with the uncertainty, which is very exciting and, and always keeps you guessing. And you never know. I mean, I never know what's going to come up. Yeah. That's what I like when, you know, when, but all to, together with that, which is the, the good side, you also have to take on the bad side of saying, well, Okay, sometimes there won't be anything. Yeah, yeah. Get over it. Yeah. And I think I think I have, hopefully, 
it's got, locked. Got no <laughs> I remember, I, I remember a dear friend of mine, his mom, who's my brother from another mother, his mother's a therapist. And I remember there was a, I was going through a bit of a rough spell when I first moved to the States and I went to visit them uh, in Cleveland and, and she sat me in her office and she says, so what's going on? And I, I didn't know where the next job was coming. I hadn't worked in a while. And I said, well, you know, I, I did this job and it finished. Now I don't know what's going to happen and all, you know, and I'm a bit nervous. And she goes, okay, so let me get this straight. So you were working, having a great time. The job ended. And now you're waiting for the next job. And I said, yes. And she looked at me and she goes, what's changed? And she's right. That's exact. That's the cycle. You know, the, the, you know, that's the cycle that it is. She just looked at me and said, so what's changed from the last... 15 years that I've known you acting, you know, and I found that very moving. Anyway, Deborah, we must move on to questions from some of the viewers today. Um, uh, so the, Michelle will give us a couple of questions through a bit of, bring back your improv skills. Time to answer things on this. <laughs> All right, go for it. Um, okay, so this, que this first question is from Theo. Uh, what are your first steps to approach a script as wild and virtuosic as Top Girls? Ah, well, <clears throat> um, well, first of all, reading it. And, um, and as I was saying before, n none of us qu quite knew if it quite actually knew what it meant. I mean, we knew the story. You, you, first of all, you, you sort of work out the story. But uh, if people watching this have know uh, know about Top Girls, it's it's the story is told sort of back to front. So um, and it's got a sort of a fantasy beginning. So it's all, it was all quite complicated, um, and so it took it took a, a time to sort of work out quite what it was all about but uh i knew i knew when i read it that i wanted to be in that last scene <laughs> it's such a fantastic scene the fantastic brilliant coming together of those two sisters and and the daughter um so yeah so so that was the initial reading and then when I, and then when I got it, is that, do, are they asking what happens when you, you've got the part mm -hmm. and the beginning, the beginning yeah. of the, uh, the acting, the rehearsal? Well, um, see, that was, that was directed by Max Stafford Clark, who I think is, is a brilliant director. And he has a very uh, he has a very particular method of approaching a text. And again, that was something that was a learning curve for me because um, he his method has stood me in good stead, which is uh, he 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 actions every scene, which means that you you work out what your what your intent what you're saying to the other person. So, uh, and it's quite meticulous. So it was his, um, his rehearsal process was a mixture of improvisation, all to do with the texts and, and the characters and exploring all of that. And then going through the, the, and then sitting down around a table meticulously going through every line and breaking it down um, to um, transitive actions. So if I would, uh, if I was actioning my, what I'm doing now, I might say that I'm um, <laughs> trying to impress you. <laughs> so I impress, I impress Michelle, and then you know if I, and then and then if I change tack a bit, I would sort of say, well, no, I'm 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 trying to um, I'm trying to soften you, or you know, trying to flatter you, or something like that. So at every turn, you would 
you would write down I mean I can get I should have brought the book I could go I can go and get the script <laughs> if you like but because I've still I keep all my scripts that's the other thing um, and it's it's a it's a it's a very I mean he does it absolutely every single line every single word but what it does is which I love and I don't, I mean, I, I, I don't do it as rigorously as he does it anymore. But what it does is it makes it, it makes the action flow. Because what you're doing is when you speak, when we speak, we are trying to communicate something. And when we, so when you're looking at the script from the point of view of actioning, you're, you're looking at what you're trying to do to the other person. And even, uh, you know, in, a, in a terms of a monologue, you're, you're, you're looking at what, what you're trying to do to the audience. Mm, yeah. So it's yeah. not, it, it stops you being all this sort of introverted stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, um, yes, yeah, so with top, and with top girls and with, yeah because that was the main thing I did with him. Um, yeah. uh, you know, actually, it wasn't a question of um, blocking or where, where do I move or anything like that. Because by the time we got up, it, we just knew, we just knew where we were going to be. Wow, wow. Well, you know. A table read, that's actually effective. That's always useful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> go on, Michelle. <laughs> Next question. Okay, next question is from Paul. Uh, do you feel in today's landscape, theaters could consider bringing the repertory training model back or should people look at forming their own companies and touring? Oh, mm -hmm. um, well, I don't, I do, is, is, uh, is this in America, Michelle? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. well, I, d I don't know the system. I don't know this. Uh, you know how many how many theatres there are still in America, um, but sadly, a lot of the repertory companies in in England have have closed. And I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in this in uh, after we all come out of lockdown. I mean, it yeah. is it is a very very serious time. I don't want to be depressing. But it is very sad, and it's very, it, it's very, it's a completely unknown territory. Um, so, what, what, what was he saying? Was she, he, she saying? He was saying that does it make sense to bring back the repertory training model, or does it make more sense to sort of work on forming your own theater company or doing touring kind of work? Well, I think ev anything. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, anything that anything that works, anything that's going. And as I say, we took this is years and years and years ago. We took we took plays round to theatres that were in existence um, and art centres and things. But they were also doing their own shows. Mm -hmm. uh, it's as I say. I think. It's not an either or. Mm. It's just yeah. whatever, whatever you can, whatever you, how, whatever form you can do it in. Just try and do something. And I think, I mean, I, I've, I've been thinking about this. Uh, in a way, this, this whole process that we're doing now, and and the, what we might be doing on next Saturday, is is fascinating because this might be the form that theatre has to take. In the in the immediate future, mm -hmm. and I think it's quite it's it's interesting to um, to see how how we can use this form and to, to, to greater effect. I mean, I was just watching. I'm going off point a bit, but um, no, go on. Uh, I was just watching Andrew Scott. Do you know him? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah I love yeah, him. Yeah. Oh, he's, a, he's, he's, he's very popular uh, over here. Have you seen Seawall? I have. I've seen the public did Seawall over here, which I saw with Jake Gyllenhaal. And I don't. 
No, I think this is this is something. Uh, it's another thing. It's another okay. play. It's a little mm -hmm. monologue. Yeah, I think it, it's the same. I think it's the same because it came from the UK. Oh right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, he he's he did one. He's just done. They they filmed it. Okay. It was a twenty minute thing. Yeah. And um, he did it. They filmed it. Uh -huh. And it's been on. It's just been on uh, YouTube for the last week. I think it's finished. I think sadly it finished yesterday. Oh no! <laughs> yes, it was. But as a masterclass of of how to present something on screen, yeah, it, it was just extraordinary. So it and that was exciting to see. Um, I mean, it was a monologue. So I don't. I don't know how you do quite. Um, plays between with more than one person, but mm. okay. great. All right, maybe one more question there, or, oh, or yeah. maybe two. Tell me. Um, let, let's go for two. I'm um, just great. We started just a little bit late. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, this question is from Anne. What do you do uh, to enjoy in your downtime that makes your makes you a richer human? Mm. Well, I mostly what I do is gardening <laughs> because I have got the most beautiful garden. I've got an 80 foot garden. Oh, wow. It's a big garden. And it's at the moment, I wish I could show you. Yeah. Because it's full of roses, full, full, full of roses and peonies and wallflowers and sweet williams and oh it's just so beautiful um and also vegetables i've got a vegetable patch halfway down and it's just gorgeous so that's that's what i do a lot and what walking, vegetables do you have in there right now what have i got i've yeah. got um runner beans <laughs> i've got um french beans i've got chard and broccoli and spinach you don't even need to go to like Waitrose or anything. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Well, yes, but I've also got very nice shops down the road. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but that gives is. me great. That gives me great. Um, makes me very happy. We've heard that from a few other actors as well too. That gardening, um, I think yes. it just allows you not to be on your phone or technology and like yes. focus. And on you can phone. you can completely. You just you just go into you you start well what I do is I just you know I start off doing a little bit there yeah. and then three hours later I'm somewhere else and I yeah it's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well last question. Um this is gonna be my question, but you've said that you know you've turned down a lot of roles before and mm. what have often been the reasons that you've decided not to take something? Um, well, lots of, re lots of different reasons. And the ones, I think the ones that, that I, could, I could say, not because I'm not going to tell you which ones, because other people <laughs> did done them and, you know, so that's no point. But um, I think the ones that I regret, I, I don't regret turning things down that I didn't want to do really, you know, but the ones that I do regret have always been because I was frightened, I think somewhere, you know, for, for some reason. And um, I would say to anybody, don't, don't be frightened, <laughs> you know, go, uh, well, you, you, you've got to, this is within reason, you've got to uh, examine what, why that, why you would be frightened to do it. Wow. And then, and, and then if, if you understand that it's just being frightened of jumping in, then jump. Yeah. But if, it, if it's something that you think, no, I don't, I don't like this, I don't really want to do it, then that's fine. But, um, yeah. It's funny that that's a really great question, and because that really means because there's a project 
in the pipelines for me that I'm absolutely terrified of doing. And it's, it's pure fear. It's pure, it's pure fear because of where it will ask me to go, but I'm absolutely certain I have to do it. And this is so weird that you're talking about this because this has completely nailed it in the head that there's no question I have to do it because it's all fear. And I think it's, it's important to ask yourself why you're frightened about it at all, you know? Um, Deborah, you've been an amazing guy. I just, I could have, I, I ran, I overran with the questions and then open it long enough for people to ask questions to you because it was just so fascinating getting to, and it's so weird that we've done two seasons together and yet I just feel like I'm unpeeling, I'm getting to know yeah. you again, you're full of surprises. Just, oh, it was so <laughs> lovely, it was really lovely to talk to both of you and, and I, I, I was, I was scared of doing it, but, but, but you did it, lovely you did time. It. I did it, <laughs> you did it. So um, thank you, Deborah. Um, just to let the people watching before we open up your mics and say thanks to Deborah, I, my guest in about 50 minutes will be Arian Moyed. And then um, later this week, uh, Deborah and Arian will be coming back for their master classes. So Michelle, could you um, open up for people to say mm -hmm. thank you to Deborah and all that? Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. Enjoy the pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Amazing.